Greetings and salutations. This is Abe Abdelhadi with The Bitter Truth. Uh, my guest tonight is uh, Chris Ward. You may remember Chris from uh, a few weeks back. We discussed uh, lithium in Afghanistan and everything else. Chris, Chris has a very prodigious military career. Uh, he was in several hot spots. He was in Bosnia back in the day. Uh, very well versed. He also uh, is one of the leaders of the American Legion in Colorado, helped get some of the guys at the DAPL a couple of years back to protest the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline. Uh, Chris, are you there? I am, absolutely. Thanks Chris, for man, me on. hey, thanks for coming on, man. A lot, of, a lot of things have been happening since we spoke last. Um, kind of wanted to talk about South Korea a little bit and get into some of all of what's uh, going on between the North and the South and everything. This, I guess the simple question first is, you know, what are your thoughts on the three hostages getting released? Well, to be honest with you, I'm not sure what, I mean, it definitely, of course, was a good show by, uh, by the North Koreans. Uh, they definitely believe that it's going to kind of uh, lay out the table for a summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un to, to talk and negotiate further about the the peace agreement between North and South Korea and finally uh, an end to the, you know, more than 50-year armistice agreement. So uh, behind the motivation and what the catalyst was for that, I think a lot of the media believe, you know, or, you know, when we talk about uh, what we're seeing in the media where they're trying to uh, shine the spotlight on Trump and say this is something Trump did, I I don't see any indication that this was something that Trump did. Matter of fact, I think that his uh, uh, his Twitter assaults against uh, the North Korean uh, people and their leadership probably did worse for foreign relations than anything else. Uh, I think that uh, for some reason that this is a part of that North Korea South Korean agreement. Uh, was to release these prisoners, and it just so happened that they were American. Okay. Uh, you know, Trump did a big, big welcome, you know, to them. You know, we're glad to have them on their way home and, you know, or our home by now. And so, uh, but as far as, yeah, the uh, I wouldn't be pinning a ribbon on his chest for anything that uh, occurred <laughs> with the release of the hostages. Well, let me, let me, okay, to me, and this is where, you know, I take umbrage with this, conservative liberal discussion which because I, I think it's flatly stupid um i had some problems a few years back when obama made the deal with the iranians for example um a lot of it was fear-based however what i've noticed in our history we make deals with people that actually have nukes we don't make deals with people that don't have nukes we bomb them and so right. the whole letting go of these hostages kind of coinciding with Trump wanting to sit down and talk, the first sitting president to sit down and talk to communist North Korea. Do you think some kind of a deal got made to let those guys go? Or wh what are your thoughts on that? It could have easily been. Um, unfortunately, I'm not buying the curtain to uh, see what, what the agreement was to release the hostages. Like Iran, we knew, we knew what the agreement was um, after the fact. Uh, and the whole not negotiating with terrorists doesn't seem to, you know, we're not this. I don't know what was negotiated to release the hostages. Uh, the media hasn't highlighted anything. Uh, even the uh, uh, Council on Foreign Relations hasn't mentioned anything about what the agreement was to release the hostages. So, um, you know, I, I hate to even say it, but I think that it was done on goodwill to help further the peace agreement by the north koreans so, yeah okay well i mean and this is where i kind of again i don't know because you're right i haven't seen anything either it's not like the iran the iran deal where we saw everything kind of as it was transpiring you saw that the um the the sausage being made as it were but it's it's almost just too emotionally and intellectually dishonest to assume that Trump, who was calling this guy Rocket Man six months ago, is suddenly now willing to come to the table in June and sit down with them if some kind of quid pro quo hadn't been arrived at. And and I, I know we're this is very uh, this is very simple stuff compared to what we're probably going to get into, but um, I I just I just have a hard time believing that there was not a deal made, and I don't have a problem with that. The, the challenge I've got with the so-called left is they keep pushing this guy to saber rattle. 
nuclear powers. Like they want to, they 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 want us to get into this brand new made up Cold War with Russia and turn it into a hot war. We seem to not mind that a couple of weeks back or a month and a half ago, Israel bombed Syria, killing like twenty Iranian soldiers, and now it's getting pretty hot again. Apparently, you know, tensions are flaring and. Israel has 300 nukes. We seem to not mind that. The Pakistanis, not a very stable, quote-unquote, ally, have nukes. So right. why North Korea? Why are we lambasting them to the degree that we are from the so-called left, that Trump's not tough enough on North Korea, when talking to your enemy, especially an enemy that has nukes, seems like it'd be a good idea? Well, you know, just for the listening audience, uh, you know, typically when I get into discussions about Korea, I just want everybody to know first is, is that I served in Korea for a year uh, as a part of the uh, reconnaissance platoon for the 29 Infantry out of Camp Casey. So I was uh, just about 35 kilometers south of the DMZ. Uh, but in 95, Korea was a, a lot different model. I mean, from the from the Korean War days, uh, the only damage I was doing was to myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, uh, 19 year old, fresh out of boot camp, and that was one of the questions that I that I had. First of all, was when I when I arrived, I was like, "Well, why are we in Korea in the first place?" Because you know, I had understood uh, just in a nutshell that they had signed an armistice, to essentially a, a ceasefire agreement, but the war still continued. Right. So. Uh, so the DMV, though, I mean, it was so safe that they ran tour buses to the DMZ. Wow. So there was no, yeah, there was no, I mean, people, not just not just soldiers. I mean, there were civilians that would go up to the DMZ. I actually walked into, there's a meeting room right on the DMZ where North and South Korea are split. So there's this giant dining table. Uh, I can't recall how many seats are at this table, but essentially the room splits the border of North and South Korea, 50, 50. And, uh, so I actually was able to walk through North Korea inside the room, <laughs> but there was a dramatic difference in the way I recognized the military strength of South Korea and what I saw in North Korea. So when I looked, I mean, they're right there. The North Korean soldiers at the DMZ are right there. They're visible at the DMZ. You can see them You see what they're doing. And they they were kind of like typical American soldiers. They were kind of smoking and joking and relaxed posture, sitting around, you know. And it was very uh, – they weren't on any high rate of, grade of alert whatsoever. Sure. Now, the South Koreans, they have, uh, they have what they call the, the ROC, the Republic of Korea, uh, so the Special Forces – that were poised there. And I'm telling you, these guys were genetically bred in a warehouse somewhere because they're six foot tall plus Korean guys built like brick shit houses. And they, what their post is, they would stand at the building. And what they would do is half of their body would be protected by the building while the other half is exposed and looking directly into North Korea. And they would stand there for six to eight hours at a time. Without moving. And these are the South Koreans? These are the South Koreans. Okay. And and so it's, you know, a lot of people, when they, they talk about it, it's one of those, and you'd mentioned it too, when you talk about the nuclear capabilities and the saber rattling, is is that I never saw North Korea as a, uh, a powerful, I, saw, I mean, essentially, I mean, they do rank, I think, in the top, I'm, I'm going to say they're in the top 20, but... South Korea has the seventh largest military force on the planet. Out of all the countries on the planet, South Korea is number seven. Wow. And that doesn't count our backing. That does not count the 34,000 U.S. troops or 35,000, something like that, that are stationed in South Korea. Right. And then you have another 40,000 in Japan. And then you've got uh, what's Guam, which is pretty much a permanent aircraft carrier <laughs> right. floating in the ocean. And so you're talking about if North Korea Hey Chris, Chris, Chris. I was there. This is I'm sorry. Hey something's happening to your phone. You got muffled for a second. Um you were talking about the thirty five thousand US troops in Japan or South Korea rather and then you kinda went away. Oh I apologize. 
so then I said that, you know, we have, yeah, we have 40,000 personnel in Japan and then we have Guam, uh, which is, uh, uh, pretty much used as a permanent aircraft carrier. And that's when, when I was there in 95, I wasn't concerned about the North Korea rolling into South Korea. And they did have artillery pieces that would have hit Seoul, but they had no nuclear capabilities whatsoever. And I venture to say that they still don't. So they do have rockets. Um, they were testing uh, ICBM, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, but at first, they were lucky to get them even out into the ocean. Right. You know, and they would just crash. And so when we, when the, when Americans were like, well, they're going to attack, you know, they're going to nuke the United States. I said, they would be lucky to pull off Guam. And this is what I said. I said, if they hit Guam, it's because the United States allowed it to happen. Mm, okay. The only, because now we could get American support for a significant retaliation. Sure, absolutely. But yeah. we have such a nuclear deterrent right there in the Korean Peninsula, let alone the, the U.S. submarines that, are, that, are, that have full nuclear capabilities that are sitting right there. If they launched anything, we would knock it out of the sky before we hit, you know, the clouds. So see, well, and but see, this gets to my point. Excuse me, earlier ago, or, or a minute ago, about saber rattling. You mentioned the thirty-five thousand troops. The thirty-five thousand troops we have in South Korea, on top of what they already have, these you know corn-fed huge guys who you know shit bullets. Um, could it also be what North Korea has been doing since uh, Kim Jong Un's dad uh, was getting his hands on something and testing 15, 20 years ago and everyone was losing their mind and clutching their pearls? Isn't that sort of based on the fact that the last time the United States was in Korea, we wiped out a million of those people, turned it into basically what we saw pictures of Puerto Rico. It, that's what North Korea looked like. Completely wiped out, devastated, leveled, and killed a million of their people. And yet on a daily basis for 70 years, we keep buzzing their borders with B-52s, saying that we're on testing runs and bombing drills and things. It, wouldn't that make sense as far as perspective for the North Koreans to want to arm themselves and defend themselves? And even if they had nine rockets that worked, and six nuclear warheads to attach to those rockets to go after Guam, say. We, we're based in Guam. Our, B, our B-52s fly out of Guam and buzz that border. Isn't that enough of a reason for them to want to defend themselves? And why is it that we demonize that instinct in the American media? Well, it, and it goes back to what you mentioned about the Cold War, is, is that when, when Truman... That, you know, he he painted the Korean conflict as a war against communism itself, and so we knew we can never win a land war in Asia. You know, because <laughs> if you've seen if, if you've seen the Princess Bride, folks, and apparently many of our generals and last four presidents have not. Continue. <laughs> exactly, and it's and it's because you can't move a significant force that far into Asia. You know, and to deal with, you know, now you're cut so far off from your support. That's why we just litter the entire planet with military bases. Uh, so we always have little staging points along the way. That's mm -hmm. the, the big um, trouble that we had with, uh, I think, it was, I want to say it was Turkey, right. was uh, the U.S. setting up a military installation there, which I think as of last year, Turkey kicked out. I'm not even sure that... The U.S. troops are allowed there anymore. Um, no, they're still but, but they're still a NATO country, aren't? It, wouldn't that violate their NATO agreement to kick us out? Yeah, I, I can't. And it may have been a new base that they just didn't allow. There was some degree of it. Okay. I would have to look. Okay. Up. But the when they, when they looked at it when um, so was it 1950 was the war. You know, the North Koreans go flooding down into because they had they had all the best intentions is to unite Korea by by superior firepower. So you had your your the communists, you know, flooded down from North Korea and got as far. And then all of a sudden we drop, you know, General MacArthur, you know, right into uh, Korea to offset the conflict, uh, which only engaged the Chinese, right. you know, to push us back to the 38th parallel. Right. 
you know, where we've pretty much stood our ground ever since. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, so, so here we are and we're getting ready to, and I won't even get into the Middle East, um, this second, it'll probably come up because to me, it's almost all related. It's to do with the war machine, frankly. But so we're getting ready to sit down with North Korea next month. Kim Jong-un is excited, I guess, because uh, that means he gets to keep his palace and his co or whatever he does. And, uh, you know, Donald Trump is you know going to sit down with him and, you know, make all these demands off of what I would consider a very limited nuclear capacity. Is that Am I ignorant to think that? I don't think they're – Israel has 300 real nukes. I mean, Pakistan has, I think, 100. I mean, what, what does North Korea have that's so threatening? Is it just, a, is it just a, a mask? I mean, China doesn't seem to be concerned, and China is on their border. Well, and it's – the fact that North Korea doesn't want to play ball. They don't participate in the World Bank. Uh, same as Syria. So when you look at these countries where they're trying to overthrow dictators – you can almost bet that they don't have a bank account at the World Bank. Mm, okay. So all of these, and, and you and I had talked about it in the past, where these corporations and special interest groups, uh, the, in particular the multinational ones, you know, they, they depend on uh, these leaders playing ball. And typically it always plays to the U.S. favor. Right. You know, we're always a take first, you know, and give later uh, country, I've seen this throughout many campaigns around the world, um, where the 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 what was it the the uh, the process uh, the means always justify the ends, right? And so with North Korea, it's not that they're so bad; it's just is that the war on terror had kind of run its run. It, it hasn't run its course yet, but when when people start saying, "Hey, by the way," who's financing ISIS, and that starts coming to the mainstream media, they have to deter the American people's attention away to another demon, uh, because if they found out that the United States is actually financing the guerrillas uh, uh, in in Syria, well, now we've got a different problem. Well, this isn't hard to get news. I mean, al-Qaeda, now al-Nusra, ISIS. ISIS was invented for Syria, specifically. And we didn't learn from Israel, for example. Israel got in bed with Hamas. I I was in the Middle East 30 years ago. Hamas was like nine guys who couldn't agree on a falafel recipe. Very disgruntled guys. They couldn't get any juice. Nope. (laughs) Nobody knew who they were. You know, it was like it was like Muhammad, Ali, you know, uh, Rajib. Nobody liked them. And and they weren't popular in school. It it, it was like Hamas was like the punk band. Of 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 the of the of the of the Middle East terror wars in the seventies, I heard a joke. An old comedian once said that the reason punk rock got started was a bunch of ugly British guys couldn't get laid. It's like, raw, I can't get fucked neither. We'll start a band, okay? That's what we'll do, and that's what Hamas was. And for for a while, they labored under that, and then Israel decided to make them a political arm and put some money into them. And like any good terrorist organization. About a year into business, they're like, hey, what are we doing with these guys? Let's, let's just branch off and do it ourselves. And and so that's how that got started. And so when you when you, when you look at the, the, the current situation with Syria, it is all these guys that we either started back in the 80s like Al-Qaeda or ISIS specifically, which we started funding to be the rebel insurgents, the quote unquote moderate rebels, like there's moderate rebels, to go after Syria. And then that fell apart when they went into business for themselves. But yet we still paid al-Qaeda and ISIS to be the rebels, quote unquote, in Libya. And we don't ever seem to learn from this lesson. And you you look at 1990 when the warning signs were there to not mess with Iraq. Don't go bomb Iraq on behalf of Kuwait. They are both our allies technically. Let them fight it out. That was the, the logical argument of the day. But then they were making up stories about babies getting thrown out of incubators and all this bullshit, which turned out to be bullshit. And then it, and then it just started. Like we just began this expansion of the empire that really began in the Spanish American war in the 1890s, where we were running out of our self colonialism because we're colonizing ourselves for about 120 years. 
So we had to go colonize something else to create new markets, which we did based on a lie. The The USSS Maine was was a lie. It, it wasn't bombed by anybody. It just blew up because of an electrical problem proven in 1976 or 75. So all that to say that coming back now, here we see us going into Syria with these groups. Meanwhile, 1990 on, China never invaded anybody. Look at their economy. Look what they're doing technologically. Russia never invaded anybody. Survived the crash of the wall. They got a McDonald's in Moscow now. Communism is dead and they got a bunch of capitalist oligarch cunts like we do here. But we don't call them oligarchs here. We call them, you know, business people. In in Russia, we call them oligarchs. It's the same thing. But yet the the, the thing that's really frustrating is we just got tired of the Arabs, kind of like we got tired of the Germans. In World War I and World War II, it was the Germans, Germans, Germans. Those wars ended, we made the Russians our enemy. Now we're tired of the the Arabs. We are, because most people don't give a shit. I, I know people that don't even know we're still in the Middle East. I sound like a crazy, oh, wow. I, I swear to God, they like they're only now paying attention to the fact that we're in the Middle East because Trump got elected. They have no idea what Obama did in the Middle East. They have no idea what Bush did in the Middle East after 9-11. Uh, grownups, not like I'm dating a freshman from UT. I'm talking 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds, people our age who should know better technically, who don't and didn't start paying attention until Trump got elected because he's so mean. He's a mean man, right? So, I mean, uh, so, so when, I, when I say this, and this is, this is a long-winded fucking uh, preface, preface to my question, like we got tired of the Germans and moved on to the Russians in World War I and World War II, because we had Russian buddy posters all through World War II. You know, it was, it was Uncle Joe and Uncle Sam. And then now right. we're over the Arabs. And so we had to create a new enemy, and it's not a secret. You know, Robbie Mook and John Podesta, the day after the election, teamed up with Hillary Clinton and decided to blame Bernie and the Russians for her losing and concocted this entire plan and this strategy that has just turned into a two and a half year go witch hunt that has borne no fruit except for maybe there's going to be some money laundering and they paid off a, a, a stripper. It's like, where does this end? We, we, we go back to the Russians as this enemy and treat them like this communist evil threat, but they're not. And we're connecting North Korea in a strange way the same because we, we, we don't ever fail to label North Korea communist, by the way. And so it's like that whole, again, saber rattling and, 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 and coming from the left, this so-called left is what blows my mind. I mean, I said a lot in that little bit, but... What are your thoughts on, <clears throat> what are your thoughts on, for example, dragging Russia into a hot war in Syria or say these peace talks fail with North Korea, which I don't think they will, but they're kind of based in the same logic. Isn't that, isn't that the case or no? Am I wrong? Well, I mean, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to, to put North Korea and Syria in the same note, um, albeit what I said earlier about neither participating in the World Bank. Uh, as far as it, as it relates to Russia, I, I, it's almost like a gentleman's agreement that we'll, we'll, we'll be able to, uh, you know, have this military show of force and make threats against each other without ever actually going to war. I mean, the United States and Russia has never fought, ever. And so it's amazing, <laughs> you know, we're only, I mean, we were partners in, you know, a lot of campaigns in Bosnia. I worked directly with the Russians uh, in uh, a project they called Active Harvest, where we went door to door collecting uh, unexploded ordnance and weapons and so on and so forth. So the, uh, the fact that they're trying to draw Russia in, to me, I think is an insult to a lot of people's intelligence. I think that uh, the Russian people nor the American people uh, want these conflicts. Um, you know, Russia doesn't want U.S. stronghold any closer to their borders or having any uh, presence. I mean, even even territories that nobody wants to really fight over, like Kazakhstan, where massive natural gas reserves exist, and there's this quiet little squabble between 
United States, China, and Russia to gain control over the natural gas fields that are there. And so with, with Syria, it's hard to tell, you know, why they're trying to draw Russia in. Uh, but you've got two campaigns there. Uh, you've got guerrillas fighting the Syrian forces. Then you've got, then they're also financing ISIS over there. Right. So the problem happened. What we recognize is when ISIS started fighting the guerrillas that were fighting Assad's people, and it was like, wait a minute, we're, we're paying two different organizations to fight each other. And it was like, well, who's, you know, where is the, you know, and then the CIA admitted to it. They were like, oh, yeah, we're financing, you know, ISIS on the ground over there. Right. And it's, it's comical that in a, if you were to go to the Washington, if you were to go to the White House today and ask them about the United States participating in regime change, uh, they would be a complete denial. I mean, it is such a <laughs> scripted line yeah. that they say the United States has never participated in regime change. And like you said, it from the 1800s on, we participated in regime change all over the planet. Right. You know, from you know even the. Uh, Bay of Pigs invasion, where we, you know, uh, trained the CIA trained uh, Cuban exiles to, to yeah to overthrow uh, Castro, yeah. you know, rule and and that's the challenge is, is that if we don't have our puppet in their office, that's what the, that's that's the whole end game. We want we would be fine with North Korea if it was a U.S. puppet running North Korea. Well, it, it's, it's amazing. Same way with Syria. Well, same with fucking Iran. I mean, like today I was on, uh, I, I posted something snarky on Facebook and I forget what it was even about, but um, it was definitely not cool with, you know, cutting out the deal with Iran. And somebody got on and said, well, you know, they did this. I'm kind of going, really? Maybe it's a response to the fact that we overthrew a democratically elected guy in 1953 and installed a dictator for 26 years who ran roughshod until the Arabs or the Iranians finally got tired of it. And and then they overthrew this Shah who was our guy who we didn't care who, that he was who he was killing indiscriminately. And that's what we do. That's uh, Augusto Pinochet who was the the leader of Chile from 1973 till he died of old age. Well done, by the way. Um, we overthrew Salvador Allende, who was a democratically elected guy, because he was not friendly with Anaconda Copper, and Anaconda Copper was an American company. Got rid of him, installed our guy. Our guy was cool with Anaconda Copper. We didn't care what the fuck he did. There was this band called Camper Van Beethoven when I was in college, which morphed into a popular band called Cracker. But they had a, they had a song called uh, General Pinochet's Cadillac, and it was... A hilarious, sad, hilarious song about the fact that this guy basically did all that he did because we promised him about five figures a year and or six figures a year and a Cadillac. And we let him do whatever. And it didn't matter as long as he was cool with copper and the United States. That's what we do. But American exceptionalism blinds people. And I mean, and I love that term, American exceptionalism. And and all the other term I want to bring back, I might be a little older than you, but there was a great term in the '80s called jingoism, and that pretty much said all you need. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. We need to bring that term back too, because if you think we're so goddamn perfect and we don't do anything wrong, and these so-called lefties that want to hang on to the idea that our election was compromised, I'm like, really, really. Let me, well, the sanctity of our elections. Okay, it's laughable that you could say that with a straight face. When you look at just the CIA alone, last 70 years, the 80 elections we overthrew, the six sitting leaders that we walked in and either killed or deposed. I mean, really, do you not know your history? The Iran thing, people bitching about from 79 on, no idea. Sykes-Picot agreement, Ottoman Empire, what we did there with that. I mean, uh, it just or I should say the Europeans, it goes on and on and on. Um, but I want to ask you a question really quick and, and use this as a catapult to whatever else you want to talk about on this matter because you mentioned earlier that North Korea and Syria are not in the World Bank. What other countries don't participate in the World Bank? Uh, the other countries like Nicaragua. Okay, yeah, wow. Uh, I would have to look at who else is not participating. I think there's only five, I think, major countries that are not participating. 
in the World Bank. And so the World Bank, I mean, they make financial slaves, and rightfully so. I defend, you know, these countries for not participating because the World Bank's sole mission is to loan money to countries. Yes. To put them into debt, and they they happen to do it with the United States. We are not. We are We weren't. We didn't walk away unscathed. We are. We are in so much debt that it doesn't even exist on the planet. Like there's no way we could pay back the amount of debt that we owe. Well, I mean, and every dollar we get is is buried in debt itself. Right. Uh, well, it's not even worth the payment. Absolutely. Well, I mean, shit. The, the 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 Wall Street is worth thirty trillion dollars right now. And I love how people say, oh, well, you know, Trump's in and, the, well, the stock market's up. I give a shit. The stock market doesn't affect the economy. It does not. Wages, right. wages are still stagnant. We still have half the people in this country making under 30 grand a year. That's a failed system, man. That's not the economy. No, absolutely. What, having, having Wall Street being worth $30 trillion. By the way, if anybody doesn't know what a trillion dollars is, 2005, I did this math on a plane once because at the time, my phone my phone will do it now, but in 2005, my phone wouldn't do it. A trillion dollars, if you were born on the same day as Jesus and you got paid $42 million a month until just this past Christmas time, that's $1 trillion. So for 2018 years, you got $42 million a month. That's $1 trillion. The Wall, uh, Wall Street is worth $30 trillion. The U.S. is in debt $22 trillion. Our annual budget is $3 trillion. A third of that goes to defense. We have 1,200 bases worldwide that we know of, which is which is something I wanted to ask you because I know this feeds right into the North Korea discussion. We've got 1,200 bases that we know of. What are the other bases that exist, like covert kind of things, that we don't know of? Do we have any bases, say, for example, or operations in North Korea that we'll never know of? I mean, what, what's going on with all that? So with, it's funny, it, it, I, and I've actually talked to people about where, um, whenever I was broaching, working in the intelligence arena, and I wanted to, I was like, yeah, we have all the bases that we know of, and then we have bases that we don't know of. I was like, what countries are we in? And they looked, you know, the, the authority that I was talking to at the time said, Chris, there's not a country that we're not in. Hmm. So we have, we have, and I was like, uh, you know, I just threw it out. I was like, are we in Ireland? They said, yes, we have troops in Ireland. I was like, what about, you know, parts, you know, the outstretches of Africa? And they go, yeah. And even on my, you know, journeys to India, uh, every once in a while, they'll, it, I'll get strange questions. People ask me if I'm affiliated with the military unit there. And I'm like, well, I'm not, uh, I wasn't aware that there was a military unit here. Uh, and then they're like, oh yeah, they, you know, they train with our, you know, Indian army and so on and so forth. So I, I truly believe that the United States has some sort of presence, even at least, uh, intelligence assets, uh, in every country. So, but to, to say where exactly I wouldn't know. That's okay. That, that, that's amazing. And the, and the, and the only reason I ask is because, I mean, 1,200 bases is a fuck ton of bases. And 800,000 troops that we know of, which puts us, as far as I know, with the exception of only a few countries, in every country in the world. I mean, you know, what, what I love teasing my, my so-called Christian right friends who think, you know, Trump is forgiven, blah, blah, blah. Um, they, they, they seem to not understand that, all right, um, We're, we're we're in the we're in these we are we are we are infiltrating every single country on earth. Meanwhile, you guys go on and on and on about how we're falling apart because of quote unquote sin, right? Um, oh, sodomy and blah blah blah. Listen, the 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 Romans and the Egyptians and the Greeks didn't fall apart because of sodomy. They fell apart because they overextended themselves militarily. And when you look at our competitors, China doesn't have bases everywhere. Russia doesn't have bases everywhere. We do. And how these learned guys, these educated guys, fail to miss that lesson is kind of beyond me. You're supposed to know more than me. 
I'm just a, a fucking employee benefits guy in the daytime. I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a professional. Uh, Americans' heads would explode if a foreign military force was marching through the streets of any given U.S. town or city. Oh fuck yeah! I mean, if they saw, oh my god, it would be, it would be over. And it's amazing how we justify it because we get back to like what you said, the American exceptionalism. You know, we have this nationalistic view that the um, that the we're supporting democracy. We have never been a democratic state ever in American 250 years of our history. We've never have been a democracy. We've always been a republic. But the, we throw around democracy. <laughs> You know, as a as a kind of the key word to, to kind of get you know our you know less learned its brothers and sisters to support all of these campaigns okay. because they believe that we if we keep the bad guys if we kill them at, at their home we're not going to have to kill them on our front porch. Okay, back back up a second because and this is where I claim ignorance um, because I was always under the impression up until about maybe the 1870s, 80s, we were a democracy. And pretty much after the 14th Amendment is when we became a republic, more of an oligarchy. Is Am I wrong in that? Explain that a little further. Well, they had always had, um, I mean, even back to the Continental Congress, they had had representatives. Uh, that spoke for the colonies, uh, even uh, against the British. Okay. Uh, it was in the, it was, there are a few rebels that decided it, but they, but uh, I think it was was it Thomas Jefferson. Even uh, the way he defined democracy was as mob rule. Okay. Because our forefathers recognized the fact that if if the majority were to make policy we would be in a whole worse state than we are in now. Because if, let's say, the majority wants, let's say that tomorrow, the majority wanted to reinstate slavery. Well, it would have to happen in a democratic state. Wow. Okay. You know? So we've, I mean, as far as, I mean, I, I can have to go back and look to double check, but as far as I'm concerned, we've never uh, been a democracy. Okay. Well, and then- I mean, except for like high school High school politics. Right. <laughs> well, we're we're, yeah. we're 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 there were Indian givers, right. because they gave it to us and took it back. Those Indian givers. Um, right. But uh, really quick, I'm looking at my phone really fast. And to answer your question or the question I asked you earlier, um, the five United Nation member states that are not members of the World Bank are Andorra, Cuba, Liechtenstein, Monaco, and North Korea. I know. I, I I have to recant. I I was confident that Syria and Nicaragua were not participants, but uh, I noticed that too that they are actually members of the World Bank. So I don't know. No, no, no. I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I just want to know for my just for my own edification. But just so you know, I, I and I've never heard of Andorra, by the way. So, but yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Or Lich- Liechtenstein is not in, invading any country anytime. I didn't even know there was a Liechtenstein. So. I know a Roy Liechtenstein who made these great paintings in the 60s when he was getting blown by supermodels, but I had no idea that mm-hmm. it's an actual country. Monaco, I don't care, Monaco. I mean, if we're going to invade Monaco, uh, you know, I'm sure Grace Kelly's kids would be pissed. But then, you know, Andorra, right. and Andorra, what's Andorra? I, no uh, I thought it was a type of fruit. Yeah, 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 it sounds like a sweater. I'm just like, you know. <laughs> but but see, and as we're talking, this this is the thing that kind of um, you know, kind of back to uh, you know, back to the original point about about North Korea and what when, and what this is all going to mean. What do you think is going to actually happen when Trump visits next month? I mean, how's that supposed to go down? What, what what's the expectation, and what do you think is going to really go down? Uh, you know, I, I want to look positive on it. I, w- I would just because. Whenever I was serving there, uh, I worked along what they called Katusa. These were Koreans augmenting the United States Army. And many of these Katusas had family, not even, I mean, grandparents, aunts and uncles that were living in North Korea uh, that they were never able to visit. Um, So they were always concerned about their well-being because during the, when I was there in 95, uh, we had a massive um, uh, flood. 
And I mean, I was, I was a victim of the flood. I was up in the mountains right there on the demilitarized zone. And they had lost, I think, 80, 90 percent of the rice crop in North Korea that year. Uh, it was also a time uh, following that we had the worst malaria outbreak Korea had ever seen. Uh, their economy was in shambles, I mean, well before that, but I mean, this was, this decimated North Korea, of course, except for the, the, the royal family. <laughs> but the, what I always looked at is, is that uh, to me, uh, uh, whatever pathway to peace we can take is the, uh, is the best because the, the ability to unify North and South Korea, and they may, they're not, they're not going to unify. But take down the border, allow them to open up trade, because trade embargoes have never done anything good for any country in world history. Ever. Like, nobody can ever show me an example of where an embargo did, had any benefit. Nope. So if we can, if we can create a, you know, let's dissolve the, the armistice agreement, bring the war to a close, lift the embargoes, you know, and then start trading that and, you know, and just showing some... I think that the, the North Korean, you know, people will be saved in the end. That's my best case scenario. So utilizing uh, Trump as my representative, I wouldn't even send him to represent me. No shit. Like if I had a, if I had a negotiation with anybody, Trump would be the last person I would call. Right. Um, well, he's proven himself. So he's proven, he's his, pro- his understanding of foreign policy is, is, you know, I think my my eleven year old niece has a better uh, track record on uh, you know working with foreign dignitaries oh. than than uh, Donald Trump. Oh does. fuck me, so running his, I, his. I don't know what could come up. His his, his foreign policy understand it, it, the Iran deal. His understand. I mean, it, at infantile at best. Um, when I saw him talking about the Iran deal, and. It, it was clear that he didn't understand the deal. It was clear that he didn't understand what was currently going on. He it seems it seems like he has no idea that there are inspectors there on a monthly basis, and that the Iranians are playing ball. I saw some stupid you know headline in the New York Times. Um, I guess in the Parliament they are burning something. You know, yelling death to America. I'm like, you think maybe you think they're kind of maybe a little over this shit. I mean. We've been fucking with those guys for over 100 years. And it's all about perspective. And this is the thing that really angers me about American exceptionalism and the average American person is that they watch the news. They want to think we're special. We're great. We're the big whiz-bang idea guys. And we invent everything. No. No, we're not. No, we don't. And by the way, you're being spied on. Your rights are being stolen from you on a daily basis. You don't have any, by the way. And if you post a tweet, you could be held indefinitely like a Gitmo prisoner. So what this guy understands about the Iran, or the American-Iranian history, it's like he doesn't have any other knowledge other than Fox News. And I'm not... I, I, and that's it. Yeah, and I am not a, 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 a corporate Democrat supporter. Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, cunts. They're cunts. The Democratic Party, right. loaded with cunts. If you're a corporate Democrat and you're voting for anyone who is not a serious progressive and you just think because you hate Trump and you're thinking with your lizard bird brain that you hate Trump that bad that anybody is better than him, you're an idiot. You're part of the problem. Don't vote. And I mean that from the bottom of my little black heart. And he's the same way on the so-called right. And they just – and they have no – they no checks and balances. You – Israel is – last 20, 25 years, I believe in their right to exist. I'm probably more pro-Israeli than anything else. But if you're going to tell me that for the last 20, 25 years, they haven't been milking the Holocaust more than it should, because they are. Because if you criticize him, oh, if you criticize him, you're called a racist and an anti-Semite. I'm like, two months ago, you just shot 750 civilians and five journalists at the border – not Hamas guys, not Hezbollah guys, not the guys that launched 7,000 rockets into Israel in 2014. Civilians. Civilians. And they did that. Unchecked. Not one thing did I see in the American media except for Chris Hayes did three whole minutes when he's allowed by his corporate masters to tell the truth. 
And I say we treat Israel like we treated South Africa back in the 80s. We didn't, I had a, I had a guest on a couple weeks back uh, who worked in the Middle East for a little bit as a volunteer in the West Bank, basically wearing a t-shirt, jumping in between Arabs and Jews and saying, hey, don't shoot each other. Um, his theory, and I agree with this, is that we should p- impose sanctions. BDS is not anti-Semitic or, 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 or racist. You guys are behaving like a bunch of fuckers and you're hurting civilians. And then we should also impose sanctions through the World Bank and the IMF and the Russians and the Iranians on Hamas, Hezbollah, and the PA. Because if Mahmoud Abbas has $13 million to build a palace and $50 million to buy a fucking airplane, meanwhile, Bibi Netanyahu, who's the prime minister of an actual country, has to fly first class, there's something wrong there, especially when the civilians are suffering. And we keep going on that narrative over and over and over, and Trump's knowledge of what's going on over there especially with with Iran and what's going on with that deal, what that deal was, which I was against in the beginning. And the only reason I was against it in the beginning was it was it was formed out of fear. But then you got to figure, if we make a deal with these guys, it's because they have something. Otherwise, we would have bombed them like Iraq, right? right. Well, we'll find the WMDs eventually. And and, and a few and, and a few years back or a few years after the after the debacle, I mean, this has been making the rounds on fa- on uh, Facebook and Twitter lately. You know George Bush making jokes at the White House correspondence dinner about oh what well, there's no weapons here I can't find the WMDs anywhere. Great, tell that to the Gold Star families, you fucking cunt. Tell that to the people who lost lives and and lost relatives. Tell that to the million Iraqis we killed. Ha ha ha! I couldn't find the WMDs, but we're careful to go into Iran, aren't we? No, instead we send them a pallet full of cash for money that they claim that we owed them from the seventies when Carter was president, about a weapons deal that didn't go through and 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 make a deal with them, not bomb them. We're making a deal with North Korea. Trump's not bombing North Korea. We're sitting down with them. Because they got exactly. because they got something. And that the Amer Well while we're doing that, let's throw Saudi Arabia in there for their oh. actions against Yemen. Yeah. I mean and then you're talking about we're, it's our weapons that we're selling to Saudi Arabia that they're using against the, the civilians in the Yes. End. So that does tie, I mean, to me, the the burden of guilt falls back on U.S. soil. Absolutely. So, well, listen, it always does. It always does. Because we're the guy. And this is how we're choosing to use our power. And that's what frustrates me. And that people that go along with this, with this, with this fan, this bizarre fantasy that one day I'll be as rich as Raytheon. First of all, no, you won't. Second of all, th- these guys are not helping our economy. That's what people fail to realize. These folks are not helping our economy even a little bit. No, they're helping their personal economy. Yeah. It's, it, listen, wages have been stagnant for 30 years. We've gutted unions in this country. You, you've got 63, 63% of Americans cannot afford a $1,000 emergency. Like, it's nowhere to be found. Not on a credit card, nothing. 63%. That's a failed system, man. Absolutely. And yet we spend a trillion three on defense overseas. Like, like we are talking a second ago, we got 1,200 bases that we know of, and then you're talking about all these covert operations you know, not to, not counting the VA, which is a disaster, our nuclear program, which is at this point unnecessary. Russia spends $65 billion a year on their defense. We spend $1.3 trillion a year. The Chinese, number two. Co- well, and that's what we have on the books. What we have on the books, right. And, 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 and. What's not on the books, probably. Definitely. Well, and, 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 and I'm actually, you probably know, I'm, I'm sure you know more than I do. Because I know the actual budget, what I read was seven hundred billion, and according to Forbes and Business Week, it was one point three trillion that we don't know about. So if you're if you're right. saying it's double that, then then we're doubly fucked because, you know, th- that's money that could go it, like people don't people don't want to do the math, and again they they go to their party, they go to their line of thinking, they go to American exceptionalism, right? So, for example. When Bernie was running, and you, you you posted something on Facebook a while ago that was genius, you know Bernie's math on on on, on single payer healthcare, it's not impossible. If I'm already paying a hundred bucks a month, and the government kicks in fifty billion a year, and I pay twenty bucks more a month, but I'm not I'm not paying health insurance anymore, and my employer is no longer buying it for me, a fifty man group is paying a million five a year right now for health insurance. Right. right? 
if I took that away from the business owner, that's a million five raise that business owner just got. He could do whatever he wants, keep the jobs without laying people off, maybe give them a little boost, whatever he wants to do. But they already got a raise for not having to pay for health insurance. How is that bad? How is that a right or left wing thing? I, I don't understand it either. And when I look through the budget, um, this was, I want to say this is a year or two old information, but uh, a billion dollars goes to maintaining our existing nuclear weapons uh, silos. So not what's on the naval ships, uh, but what's what's kind of laying in the ground in U.S. soil. And those are so antiquated. I was like, weapons that we're never going to use, and we're spending a billion dollars a year right. to maintain. Well, shit, the Moab... And I was like, when... Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was saying the, the mother of all bombs, March of 17, that Trump dropped in Afghanistan, that was a $300 million weapon that Bush bought. And it just said, well, and that goes back to what we said before. You can't build new bombs if you don't use the old ones. Right, right. So, you, you so get, that's yeah. why these, these, um, th that's th that's why it's such a hard because uh, once you get into geopolitical issues and you talk about multinational companies, they're influencing global politics in order to turn a buck for themselves. Sure. So Vietnam. Uh, Gulf of Tonkin incident. You know, the, the Ho Chi Minh was pro-American. You know, you want to talk about regime change. You know, he, support, he, he liked the United States. He was a fan of us. And, uh, you know, we felt so, you know, whooped after Korea that we had to try to make an example out of Vietnam, which didn't work either. Right. So here we go. We turn on Vietnam and, you know, we lose 50, what was it, 58,000 U.S. troops in, in Vietnam during the conflict there. Right. And, uh, it was never a sanctioned war. I mean, Congress, you know, never approved it, so it was always just called a conflict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, under false pretenses. It was a uh, false flag operation. It was uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin where they they made up radio communications saying that one of their boats was being attacked by a by a Vietnamese submarine, you know, and I mean, they went as far as like yelling and screaming in the background, like they were actually hit by a torpedo. Right. Like they went into full on acting mode and it wasn't until, you know, years later that the CIA came out and said, yeah, we made it up. Right. At Johnson, then, at Johnson's like said, request. People still support this country? <laughs> yeah. Well, see, and that's the thing is, 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 and, and that's the thing where you get to the point zero zero one percent running everything, throwing chum to the sharks, right? So they, they, yeah. they, they throw this shit at us, you know, gays and guns and abortion. And those are the things, we, I, I call it high-end gossip. It's what we, it's a, that's what we run around about. You know, it, oh, Trump had a stripper. Well, fuck you. I mean, and and, right. Ken, and Kennedy got his dice blown by the hottest women in America. If I knew that I was going to get shot in the head like he did, I would still want to be reincarnated as his dick. Because Kennedy got, <laughs> he had Marilyn Monroe, he had Juliet Prowse. Even the non-famous girls were smoking hot. What's her face? Uh uh, Giancana's girlfriend that, that supposedly was, you know, leaking secrets to the CIA. Whatever, man. I mean, they've been doing it for years. Power is an aphrodisiac. Henry Kissinger got laid. That that should tell you all you need to know about power. Yeah. And it corrupts absolutely. So for people to sit there and act like we're always right and we've never fought an unjust war, with the exception of World War II, which I could even call into question, Pretty much every war we fought was an unjust war. The Revolutionary War was a glorified tax revolt. Right. Pure, pure and simple. Because honestly, would my life be any different if I was in Texas talking with a British accent and our best bands were the Beatles and Led Zeppelin? Nobody seemed to give a shit. Like I remember when the wall fell in eighty nine, when the rush when the when the when the when the um when the when the when the Berlin Wall fell. That's when I came to this realization. I was like, wow. All those people died for nothing. All those people died yep. crossing the that and, and trying to cross and getting killed and double agents and and spies and how many people did we kill? Did they kill? And and relatives couldn't see each other for years. Families were decimated because of that wall. In one day, gone. And the powers that be, oh, we got a Mo McDonald's in Moscow now. It's all better. It's all cool. Ch well, and that's the blood stain that we've left in Korea, right? Because we got to realize that we. We killed over 5 million civilians 
in Korea. It was the largest civilian casualty rate uh, even between Vietnam and, uh, I think, World War II, at least the, uh, the Pacific Theater. Wow, I didn't know that either. And so that's what North Korea remembers. They have, yeah. like, what U.S. did to us, memorial museums where you can go through and look at the photographs of what the U.S. did to their country. And in order to unify a broken country because they were financially bankrupt, they had to come up with an enemy, and we just happened to be it. But see, but, but see, so but, people think they're scared, though. It's like, it's like you know, the bully that you picked on when you were in first grade, you know, and you're worried about them coming back to haunting you, you know, haunting you later. I'm like, no, it's it's not going to happen. North Korea is this isn't. I, I think I mentioned you Red Dawn once. Right, where, right. You know, th- there's these these ideas that North Korea is going to black out the United States entire intelligence assets and technology and eyeballs, and they're going to invade the United States and take over. I was like, what? What craziness are you even trying to? Do you know what kind of a size of a campaign that would even take to do that? We're not going to wake up in, you know, in Colorado and all of a sudden see North Korean jets flying over this over Denver. See, but here's what. But, Go ahead. The uh, NRA would have you believe that they are. Well, the NRA and anybody that wants <laughs> to believe that our lifestyle, it, this is what people don't understand. Like, if, let's just say the North lost the Civil War and the Confederates won. And this is where people get real quiet. Slavery probably would have lasted longer than it should have, probably would have been made illegal by like 1910, 1920. We would have been called the Confederate States of America because the Civil War was lost. And instead of United States, which only lasted about 90 years, we became the Confederate States. And um, we'd still have the same fucking problems we do today. Wars don't do anything but enrich those supplying the wars. Exactly. The, the whole thing's a fucking racket, man. It's a the whole thing's yeah. a racket. And this, so, and and this is the point I guess I was trying to make before we got a little sidetracked and you got disconnected. You know, we we got we got some time left, a few minutes left here. I want to kind of zero in on this. So, so so, what is the goal with sitting down with North Korea? What are they going to promise us? What are they going? Are they going to actually give up their weapons? What are they going to do? I don't. You know, and I, I mentioned it earlier, I, I am pretty confident that they don't, they, yes, I believe they have a laboratory where they're working on nuclear weapons. Do they have any? I really have a hard time believing that their nuclear capabilities are very, you know, stout. I think that the, I think that's always been a threat is that they're saying, hey, we're working on it. You know, we're building rockets. We're working on collecting uranium. We're doing this. We're doing that. But I was like, at the end of the day, I was like, I really have a hard time believing that that they. That's what I don't get because I, I really don't know what they could bring to the table other than, hey, will you agree to these trade agreements? And they're going to serve U.S. interests, even though it may be through, you know, second party countries. That's what I have to believe. You know, is is that. Just like with NATO. It's like, hey, you want to be a part of NATO? It's it's a great club to be in. You just have to follow NATO rules, which just happen to be U.S. rules well, imposed and, on your country. Well, and then and then you remember when Trump was running and he was talking about how he's going to make NATO pay their fair share. And all his yay Bob followers were like, yeah, pay their fair share, man. Like, I don't know if they think NATO was like the U.N., but NATO was already pretty much paying their fair share. They had to run their own armies, their own defense. We had a base in every country or or nine, but we weren't paying for their defense. And the paying the fair share last year came out that Trump got all the NATO nations to agree to spend 2% of their GDP on buying American weapons. Right. That's, that was the big, that was the big, that was the big, they're paying their fair share, which was absolute (laughs) bullshit. So not, not, not 2% of your GDP on education, not 2% of your GDP on, on healthcare, 2% of your GDP on buying American weapons. That's the kind of shit that drives me bananas. And, And what makes me even crazier is that the left buy into this shit, punching from the right, using the CIA 
and the FBI and the NSA, the very same apparatuses, by the way, that fuck with Martin Luther King, civil rights movement, labor unions, Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter. I can go on and on. And, and they're chasing down Julian Assange. Thank you, Barack Obama. Ed Snowden is still in exile in Russia. Bradley Manning right. barely got out of jail after being tortured for seven years, or Chelsea, whatever his name is now. <clears throat> and what did these guys do? Blew the whistle on the fact that we were fucking up. But America... Actually, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. And that's Snowden. He's been out of the game so long, he doesn't have anything actionable anymore. But... He's got a cachet of damaging information that's going to, you know, I think one day will come to light. And, you know, but honestly, I don't think the media is going to talk about it because of their corporate overlords. Sure. You know, sure. The American people aren't even going to believe it uh, because it's going to basically show the dark underbelly of you know, the American military industrial complex and, and all the entities that are intertwined, you know, on a, uh, around the world. So, you know, it's, it's because the American it's, people, uh, the American people don't want to believe it, man. They don't want to believe the, the American, it. No. It, it's, it's there to be believed. The American people don't want to believe it. What pisses me off is I'll be talking to folks and at a party or at a bar or, or whatever. I mean, and I'll be hanging out and like, well, how do you know all this? I'm like, well, let's see. I don't watch, American media. I, I don't. I have a hard time. I, I'll watch it for homework. Since I started the show again, I had to start watching. Right. I had to, <laughs> I had to start watching like TV again because the only time I ever use TV is to watch Archer and sports. <laughs> so I don't like. I don't use it for my news stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I get I get that information from the Guardian or the Intercept or Chris Hedges has a show called On Contact now uh, for a couple of years on 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 RT. Um, Lee Camp, Jimmy Dore, those guys have been around four, five, six years now. Um, you know, Young Turks have been around for a while before they 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 kind of went south. But there's all kinds of places to get information, and 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 here's what's really awesome: you can cross check it. You don't need to go to the library and look it up on microfiche. Okay, you you can you can look it up. If I say that North Korea bombed the South in 2008, and nobody said shit in this country because Obama had just gotten elected. Well, you can at least look it up and find nine credible articles. Not I live with my mother in the basement dot com, but like 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 <laughs> you know, but sure, like like right. you know, some, something like Wall Street Journal. Like somebody has reported on it. If I'm saying it, it's not just me saying it. It's not just me screaming in a vacuum. And but b- because of American exceptionalism, and I, and that term is exactly what it is. We think we're better. You know, God, right. God forbid you 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 mention a statistic of another country, and what's the first thing you hear from the so-called right, right, or even people in the center left? Well, if you don't like it, then move there. If this is so bad, then then leave. Um, fuck you. I live here, and I'm able to cr- right. criticize openly because I like it here too. I'm trying to make it better. Exactly. Idiot. So no, I think if you're a citizen and you pay taxes, I think you have the right to be critical. Right. Absolutely, and critical on what we see. Okay, not your fucking fairy tale, six thousand year old cartoon. You believe Jesus died or Muhammad did this, or <laughs> I, I give a fuck. You know, it's like, well, well, you know, well, how do you not believe in God? Well, you know, it's not your business how I not believe in God. I pay taxes. And what's cool about America right. is I don't have to put the Ten Commandments on the state house lawn, but you could put it on. The, but you could put it. You could put it on the church lawn, and I still see it. You could put it in front of your house, and I still see it. Right. And, and and the left does its own version of the same thing. They're not any better. They like to think they are because statistically speaking, the people on the left are more edu- educated and they have a college degree. Yeah. OK. And that's really about <laughs> it. They, they learn to regurgitate cooler shit other than, you know, uh, Adam and Eve, whatever. They still do. Right. They still do the same shit. And so when all this stuff that you're talking about tonight with with with. Uh, it, you know, with our involvements in other parts of the world that comes with tacit American support and in a lot of cases, direct American support. I had a friend of mine that I went to high school with um, a couple days ago on Facebook talking about that if he was president, he would probably be bombing Syria too. Because he, and, he, and he's a conservative who thought it was a good idea for Obama to bomb Syria. And like, do, yeah. do you even know why we're there? No. You don't even know why we're there. It's, they couldn't even point it out on a map. Dude, they couldn't find their own navel on a map. And that's what drives me just fucking bananas. <laughs> but hey, listen, man, um, thanks for the patience. Apologies for the disconnect. 
Um, we'll definitely have you on again uh, on, on on various and sundry world topics because you're, you're seriously one of the most informed people I know and actually like, which is cool. Uh, but folks, if this stuff makes you uncomfortable, it's supposed to sleep tight and good night. <laughs>